Good morning, this is Deepak, and I'm continuing my series on worldviews. This is part of a course that uh, my very good friend Marilyn Schlitz, Dr. Marilyn Schlitz, is doing at Sophia University. And these questions have come up as she teaches her students at Sophia about worldviews. And um, I'm very happy to participate in this series. Uh, I'm also a professor for consciousness studies at Sophia University, so this is all part of our uh, course curriculum. Uh, today I want to address what happens when worldviews clash and how do we resolve conflicts. So in my first uh, video on worldviews, I explained how worldviews are formed uh, at a very early stage in our lives as the interpretation of experience that our very brain and our neural networks uh, work in a way that supports a worldview, that supports a worldview. In fact, when people go to debates where people are arguing for opposite worldviews, mostly all studies show that uh, their worldview is reinforced irrespective of the facts or so-called facts that are displayed because all facts are filtered through worldviews. So our brain and neural networks reinforce the worldviews into which we were indoctrinated. To understand how that happens, you may want to go to my previous um, video on uh, worldviews. It was the first one, and it was basically talking about how neural networks reinforce the worldview that we were programmed in. So here is uh, one thing that I have found uh, useful for resolving conflicts when people do want to resolve conflicts because not everybody wants to resolve conflicts and may many people do in fact have the worldview that conflict is the nature of um, uh, all social interaction that conflict is the nature of all personal interaction. So let's start with very, very, very basic um, experience. You're a little baby and you're given a toy. Perhaps you're given this, pencil, okay? Or you're given uh, this bracelet. The baby uh, has no idea that uh, this object is called a pencil or this object is called a bracelet. So all it has is experience. And the experience in the beginning is very fundamental. It's perceptual, which means um, it involves the five senses. There's a color, there's a form, there's a shape that is seen. Uh, the, perceptual, uh, the experience can be auditory, there is hearing. And of course the baby will lick and smell and even try to eat this. So the experience is um, uh, taste, smell, etc. The baby, as I said, might try to eat it. He may or she may bang it to hear the sound. So it involves all the five senses, may touch it to see what it feels like. As a result of that experience, uh, soon there's a feeling and the feeling could be enjoyment, playfulness, or maybe if this was um, edible, uh, made of chocolate, the, the feeling could be the desire to eat it. And then uh, sooner or later, as language intervenes, there will be thoughts associated with it. And um, ma, 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 mom might say, this, you don't eat this, this is a pencil, this is used for writing. So now a human construct is created, called a pencil. And like that, every experience we have goes through these stages. Perception, a feeling of um, pleasure or discomfort, and then uh, a thought. 
and all this is happening in awareness. So we can say awareness or consciousness is the ground of all experience, in which all experience occurs, in which all experience is known and in a way out of which all experience is made because perception and feeling and thought are modified forms of awareness itself. But now, of course, we have constructs. And as you grow, then there are other constructs that come about that shape your worldview. Economics, you are poor, you are rich. Um, in the past, if you were African-American, you're a slave. Uh, uh, women are not equal. Uh, races are different in their uh, humanity. So Jews know how to make money. Indians uh, are also obsessed with money and uh, marriage and uh, Oh, you name it, you know, Indians take the cake. I say that as an Indian. So uh, Indians are also uh, quite intellectual. Some are very spiritual, but not all are, etc. But, you know, as, as uh, experiences are metabolized, uh, perceptions and feelings and thoughts um, reinforce the validity of the interpretation of those experiences. And so everything in society that we have created, from communism to capitalism, to colonialism, to subjugation, to um, social and racial inequality, gender inequality, um, wars, colonialism, religions, these are all shaped by um, the conditioned mind. The conditioned mind is the mind that is tied to a particular worldview or to a particular ideology. So what do we do? This is a big problem right now. All the conflicts in the world are ideological problems. All the conflicts, the conflict between Republicans and Democrats, the debate over the health care bill, the style of government that America wants, um, what is happening in the world in terms of religious wars, and uh, so many things happening in the world that we can say are leading to a very unsafe world, a world that is divided, a world where there is social and economic injustice, a world where there is racism and bigotry and hatred and prejudice, a world where there is war and terrorism, and a planet that is quickly becoming unsustainable, uh, despite all the facts, people don't even agree on whether there is climate change or global warming or whether we need to be concerned about eco destruction, etc. So we obviously uh, have wars of the worldviews, wars of ideological conflicts all over the world. How do we resolve this? There are nine principles I have found that are useful in resolving uh, conflicts if two parties agree to come together with the intention of resolving the conflict. So get these could be two individuals, it could be two groups, it could be two communities, could be two nations, could be national leaders, could be a conflict between uh, political ideologies, etc. So here are the nine principles that I found useful in resolving conflicts. Number one, uh, always treat your adversary or the one who holds a different worldview with respect, because if you don't treat them with respect, then you lose them in first space. And so both parties must agree to speak to each other in, with respect. Secondly, recognize that in any conflict, both sides feel that there is injustice. The other does not understand them, or the other does not know their situation, or the other is um, antagonistic to their worldview. 
So recognize the perception of injustice on both sides. Third, in a conflict, be ready to forgive, ask for forgiveness, but also be ready to forgive. As I've mentioned before, you forgive not because in your mind the other deserves um, forgiveness, but in your mind you say to yourself that I forgive because I deserve peace. Number four, re refrain from belligerence. When you're belligerent, then you are seen as um, a coward. And uh, also, when you're belligerent, people don't respect you, so you lose them. Number five, use the principles of emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is a big topic, emotional and social intelligence, but it means get in touch with your feelings, uh, ask the other person about their feelings, uh, use some of the principles of non-conflict resolution as taught by Marshall, Marshall Rosenberg. What are you observing? What are you feeling? What do you need? What, how can I fulfill your need? While mentioning your observations, your feelings, your needs, and requesting their fulfillment. So that is what emotional intelligence means, nonviolent communication, feeling the, uh, how others feel, and um, having the ability to communicate in a way that is, um, that is nourishing, that fulfills need. Uh, so that would be number five, uh, emotional intelligence. Number six, uh, stay away from uh, verbal formulas or stereotyping people based on race or gender or nationality or religion. Uh, so avoid um, verbal formulas and stereotyping. Uh, number, um, uh, that would be number six. Number seven would be don't make the other person lose face. Don't prove them wrong. If you are right even, but if other, the other person loses face, they're never going to forgive you. So try not to prove the other person wrong. You want a resolution that is advantageous to both of you. Uh, number eight would be to refrain from bringing ideology and religion into discussion because the ideologies that we have were created at a very young age and it doesn't matter what kind of education you have, your ideology, your religious beliefs um, will be very difficult to change. Now, in my opinion, by the way, all religion is Bronze Age mythology, and although the religious experience includes beautiful things like transcendence and higher emotions like love, compassion, joy, equanimity, um, the religious experience also includes the um, loss of the fear of death, but religious ideology generally translates that religious experience into its own framework, and um, almost all conflicts today are religious or ideological. And number nine is recognize that in any conflict there is fear. There's fear that uh, the way you see the world, uh, which is the only way you can see it, is the right way to see it. So there's fear on both sides. I think keeping these nine uh, principles uh, in mind will certainly help you to go above um, the usual ways in which conflicts are, um, are, um, are, are uh, held to be um, responsible. It goes beyond the usual way to resolve conflicts, which are always proving your point and winning the debates, so to speak. Okay, now let's go again to what is fundamental reality, ultimately. How do we go beyond all worldviews based on an understanding of who we are? And this we can uh, slowly examine from our own experience. Who we are is uh, awareness or consciousness. Without awareness or consciousness, there can be no experience. Consciousness by itself is not a thing that can be observed. It only makes observation possible. 
So consciousness by itself is totally formless, has no dimensionality, is not in space-time. This is a difficult point for people to understand because they confuse themselves with their experiences and the constructs that we create around those experiences. So think of this. If all we can experience is perceptions, feelings, thoughts, and images, then that would be fundamental reality. Fundamental reality is the experience of sensations, sense perceptions, sound, touch, sight, taste, smell, that the feelings aroused by those sense perception, usually in the form of pleasure or pain, and finally, the verbal thoughts that are the interpretation of that experience. That's how a construct is built. That's how a worldview is shaped. So ask yourself, who would I be without any constructs? Who would I be without any um, conditioning? Who would I be without any labels, definitions, descriptions, name, form, etc.? If you can go through that process, then you'll understand that fundamental reality is just awareness and its modifications that we call mind, body, and world. What is a mind? You know, mind is a concept for the experience of thoughts and feelings and images. So think of all the things you have to do today. Think of all the things you have to do this week. Thoughts will arise, right? Um, try and evoke the image of a beautiful sunset or evoke the image right now of someone you love or evoke the image of your house, your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen. Just from this example, you'll see that what we call the mind is a modification of awareness that creates thoughts and images. It also creates feelings. So think of someone you love and feel the love. Think of a conflict you have and feel the anger. Okay, so mind is just a word. It's a placeholder for thoughts, feelings, emotions. What about the body? The body is another concept. It's a placeholder for sense experiences. If you close your eyes, then the only experience you have of your body is sensations. If you open your eyes, then you can have um, the experience of this shape, this color, this form. You can have the experience of sound, smell, taste. So you see the body is nothing but an intermittent stream of sensations, sense perceptions which are in another way a modification of the same awareness as thoughts and images were. What about the world? What about uh, this? This is also a perception and a perception is a modification of awareness and so this has no reality apart from your experience of it. And you could say the same thing from everything that human beings have given a name and form to. From protons to bosons to gluons to, in fact, everything that we call the universe, the world. The Empire State Building, jet planes, um, stars, galaxies, dark matter, um, space-time, energy, information <clears throat> are human constructs based on modes of knowing and experience which is happening in awareness anyway, which is happening in awareness. So everything is a modified form of awareness, a um, human construct, an ideology, um, a conditioned mind, and uh, and uh, what we call a worldview. Who would you be without that? And who would you be without that with um, a, an awareness that sees no difference between 
mind, body, and the world as um, worldviews, as uh, conditioned mind. Beyond that is just pure self awareness. And what is awareness? Awareness is the source of perception, is the source of thought, and it's also the force of volition or choice. So uh, we start to move our hand or speak. Uh, that comes from awareness. When you really totally understand that, then beyond the constructs, beyond the ideologies, and beyond the worldviews, you are pure consciousness, a field of infinite possibilities, a field of creativity, an awareness that is self-regulating, self-evolving, expresses itself in complementarities, mind and matter, etc., or what we call mind and matter, and a field of infinite correlation, inseparability, quantum entanglement. I'm, of course, using words because I have to in order to communicate, but at this level, you're connected to or inseparable from all that exists, and I would say that evokes a feeling of love, a love that is not necessarily focused on anyone, but not denied on anyone. And this is where healing occurs, healing, health, wholeness, the return of the memory of who we are beyond all worldviews. We are that which gives rise to the worldly views. We are that which gives rise to the worldviews. Once you get that, this is called self-actualization in spiritual traditions or enlightenment, then you will see um, that there is no, no conflict at this level. This is not easy. This can be a lifelong spiritual quest, but um, I thought it is important to share this with you since you are students of consciousness who want to understand worldviews and also how we get beyond all worldviews. So this is my second installment in the series on worldviews on the course that is being taught by Dr. Marilyn Schlitz at Sophia University and congratulations to all of you who are attending this course and everyone who wants to share this course. Um, this uh, video will also be posted on discoveringyourcosmicself.com and uh, you can post your discussions there as well. Thank you very much, and I'll be back with more on these discussions on worldviews. Take care. Have a wonderful day.